Welcome to the Teen Life Podcast, where we believe that teenagers are not a problem to be solved, but we are here to help you equip teenagers through the power of connection. I'm Carly Duke, and across from me is Chris Roby. Hey, guys. So, Chris, this is a different sort of episode, Uh and I'm excited about it on one hand, but on the other hand, there are some really... Um, staggering and maybe not fun things that we're going to talk about today because I want to talk about youth mental health. Yeah, this, uh, this one's kind of a bummer and it's one of those that um, I think anyone who's been paying attention or just kind of, uh, you know, watching the news or just Mm -hmm. being around teenagers. I mean, this is, we kind of saw this coming, um, but statistically, you know, data lags obviously um but what we're going to talk about today is the most uh, recent cdc uh, report is the youth risk behavior survey data in summary um and we're just we're you know on a national level starting to see repercussions of a lot of things obviously we'll talk about but um we have the data to support what, we, what we've been suspecting for a while mm-hmm So let's get into some of this. This, like I said, is going to be different from our other episodes because we're not going to do a trend and a tip, but there will be lots. This is trending, number one, and we're going to give lots of tips throughout of what we can do to help and information on how we can help our schools, especially through this. But let's get into some of the data. I'm going to link the full report. It is super long. So if you want to read the full report, go click on the link and look at it. But this is covering 2011 to 2021. So all of the data from this report was collected in the fall of 2021. But this is the first report that includes data since the start of the pandemic. And so keeping in mind that this is the first time, as Chris said, that we're seeing the repercussions of what the shutdown and school closures and all of that did for our students. And so 2021 still seems like that was a long time ago, but this data lags. And so Mm -hmm. this is the most recent data that we have. And my guess is it's probably still not very far off from where we are today and where our students are. So some things that they found um, are good news first. (laughs) Several areas of adolescent health and well-being are continuing to improve improve overall. So risky sexual behavior, so that's sexual activity, how many partners they're having, that's improving, which is good. Mm -hmm. Also, substance use is improving. So using illicit drugs, misusing uh, prescription opioids, alcohol use, marijuana use, That's increasing. And I feel like we've talked about this on a podcast episode, Chris, before of just probably even lack of availability during pandemic and not being around the peer pressure of that probably helped Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with some of that. And then finally, there was a decrease in the proportion of youth who are being bullied at school. Yeah. And I think all three of these would uh, be a result of more distancing. It's right. You know, the, the, the face to face and, so some of these, obviously, you know, you know, obviously it's good. Um, I'll be curious in two years hmm. how that swings uh, now that people are kind of back together again and back to normal. Yeah, you're exactly right. But bad news. Unfortunately, almost all other, all other indicators of health and well-being and their support have worsened significantly. Mm-hmm. And so that is, I mean, that's a direct quote from the report. It's kind of staggering. But protective sexual behaviors, so that's condom use, sexually transmitted disease testing, HIV testing, uh, experiences of violence, mental health, suicidal thoughts and behaviors, along with many other things, have Mm -hmm. just significantly worsened. And so this is a big deal. Very big deal. And these stats are going to really bear this out, Um, things that we're seeing uh, anecdotally or now. data backed and um, we'll talk about how you know it's good to have data behind this to be able to take action Um, yeah but um so take us through this uh these numbers carly right so 42 percent of high school students reported feeling so sad or hopeless almost every day for at least two weeks that they stopped doing their usual activities Hmm. so these are hallmarks of like clinical depression and that's 42 percent yeah almost half of our high school students in the past year, 22% of high school students seriously considered attempting suicide. So one in 10 high school students actually attempted to end their lives 
And in your average public high school, that's about two students per classroom. That's staggering. That is staggering. You're right. And so the um, considering stat is high and the attempt stat is very high. And so that's a scary stat. But the thing that we have found or that they have found is for girls, minority students, and teenagers in the LGBTQ plus community, mental health statistics are even worse for those populations. Mm -hmm. So in 2021, almost 60% of female students experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness during the past year. Nearly 25% made a suicide plan. Wow. So that's over half our persistent sadness and a fourth made a suicide plan. This is devastating for our female students. Yes. And then one in five girls said that they recently experienced sexual violence in 2021. 20%, that is a 20% increase since 2017 when they first started tracking that. And so that stat is also really scary for our teen girls. Mm -hmm. For our black teenagers, attempting suicide increased from 8% to 14% in the past decade. And so that's an increase in a stat. And like I said, so minority students are pretty much, du pretty much doubled. Yes, almost doubled. Mm -hmm. And then nearly 70% of teens in the LGBTQ plus community have experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. 70%. 70%. Yeah. And so it's, it makes me sad. Like I'm going to be real honest as we're talking about this stuff that our teenagers are dealing with this. And especially that certain populations are dealing with it more. Um, some questions to ask why mental health decline has lots and lots of factors. Um, the pandemic probably obviously played into this. Social media is playing into this. Stress at school, societal conflict. I feel like just our society as a whole and what people are posting and talking about is probably worse than ever. Um, but especially for girls, speaking from a girl perspective, mm -hmm. Um, girls tend to dwell on negative emotions. There's a lot of perfectionism that comes with girls and intense self-critique that I think sometimes makes these things worse. Well, and the thing is you listed there, the pandemic, social media, stress at school, societal conflict are going to fall, um, fall heavier on, on girls, especially mm -hmm. um, when it comes to Instagram and um, the comparing uh, factor and the pressure to look a certain way or act a certain way. Um, but all these things are these external um, stressors that have just, some of these are so new um, and so acute. I mean, mm -hmm. so obviously the pandemic just kind of fell on us um, and nobody had any frame of reference for that. But also it was, we've talked about this some on the podcast, but interpreted through a pretty new technology of social media, even though you know, we, it's been, seems like, I feel like it's been in our lives forever. It's only been about 15 years. Yeah. Um, that it has been the thing that is the filter that everything comes through. And so it is such an imperfect technology that's, that eliminates so many of our senses and uh, abilities to connect. It connects on such a superficial level, but it has such a, a deep impact. And so I just, I, I can't imagine being shaped, um, being, being in, in such a low, such a, a, a phase of life that is so formative being shaped by some, by these factors mm -hmm. and how coming out of a child like mind into adolescence, this is the world they live in. So it's not surprising, um, but super sad, as you said. Right. We've talked about hope on the podcast before. And as an organization, we talk about hope a lot because the power of hope, I mean, it really can make a huge difference. Um, and so I think as you think about this, put yourself, though, in the shoes of a teenager who is going through adolescence for the first time. Mm -hmm. A lot of their context is, I've never done this before. And then you throw a pandemic on top of it that no one has ever done before. And the sense of like, I'm not going to make it through this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is yeah, really I mean, difficult. It, it, I think as adults, as we were dealing with the repercussions just from a, you know, grown up standpoint, jobs and um, livelihoods and just disruption. And, and you know, th th I remember there were days I felt very hopeless. I was like this, mm -hmm. you know, th this is being played out as if this is never going to end. And like, but I also had enough context to know, okay, 
this isn't true. All things shall pass. And, and they did, but for an adolescent to be shaped in under a veil of hopelessness, it's hard to recover from. Yeah, it is. But I want to talk about how can we help? Mm -hmm. So as families, as schools, what we're seeing just almost across the board is that we have to equip our schools and our schools have to be prepared for this because of the amount of time that our students spend at school. And unfortunately, sometimes, I mean, we know this, Chris, the counselors have a ton of responsibility. We're Mm -hmm. putting so much on our schools and then we're expecting them to solve all of this sometimes. And so let's talk about how we can kind of come alongside schools and our families and our teenagers to help them. The first thing I want to talk about is coping skills. Mm -hmm. Because while I hope this will never happen again, there will be a challenge in your teenager's life that they're going to have to cope with. Mm -hmm. This is not going to be the only challenge that they face ever. And so things like, who can they talk to when they're in trouble? Yeah. And, and just to kind of circle back around on that point, we talk about this a lot in our groups that stress is a part of life. Mm-hmm. Challenge is a part of life. And um, there's no magic wand. There's no saving uh, us from, from that reality. Um, and so we can rescue. Uh, we can um, try to make it to where our kids don't really have to deal with a lot. Um, but we're also not setting them up for a lot of success when those things happen. Um, and so, as you said, that first, that first coping skill of knowing who to talk to, um, we like, we like our kids to come and talk to us as, as grownups. There's no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I want my children to come and talk to me, but I also too want them to know in the context that they spend a lot more time in, in their school, um, who, do you, who, who can you trust? Who can you go and talk to? I mean, my daughter just went through something pretty, pretty gnarly at school as a first grader. And she, you know, it was a situation she probably should have gone and talked to one of the teachers right then and there. And she didn't think about that at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it was an opportunity for say, Hey, when that happens, make sure you do tell the teacher <laughs> when that happens. Right. And, and it just hadn't, she had never experienced that before, but Um, knowing that there are people that she can trust on that campus. Now, this is hard, too, for a kid from a hard place who maybe um, is is in a school system where the grownups haven't really been there for them or maybe Mm -hmm. um, they're in in a demographic or uh, uh, a class of folk who maybe the system doesn't work as well for them. And so, um, but I also, too, believe that there are, there are, friendly people who, who can help if we, if we look for them uh, and, and are open to that help. Exactly. Some of the things that we talk about in our teen life group, because we do talk about stress and we ask them, what are some positive coping strategies that we can use? Some mm-hmm. ones that I hear a lot are music, working out, art or drawing of some sort, sports come up a lot, hanging out with friends or positive people. Um, and so kind of asking them too of when you are stressed, what helps you and let's come up with something positive Mm -hmm. that we can kind of go to. And then, you know, if this is happening, I need to take more time to do this thing. That's going to help me. Mm -hmm. And something else. Oh, go ahead. ahead. No, no, no. You go. Well, I think something else that is a a great part of this conversation uh, when, you know, you think, think through these coping skills, what can you do, but also, um, what do you need to limit hmm. and, and draw boundaries with, um, and social media and relational boundaries are a big part of that conversation and a, and, and a huge skill set to develop at a young age mm-hmm. of knowing, Hey, what's real, what's not real, um, what's worth your emotional investment. And when's it time just to turn that off and walk away? Uh, we'll talk about this, some um, in our next episode, uh, just about how we can, create distance from, from things that cause us emotional, uh, distress. Uh, but just knowing and having those conversations around, you know, who's, who's healthy in my life, who brings life and who is it that I can just need to walk away from right now and know that it's going to be okay. Uh, those boundaries are crucial. And then finally hope, which sometimes seems like it's just out there and elusive, but 
part of that is having those relationships. And next week, we're actually going to talk about distancing. Chris is going to talk about that. And I think sometimes even that can lead if you're too close to situations. Sometimes it's easy to feel hopeless. And so what can we do to kind of equip our teenagers to take a step back and go, this is just for this time. Mm -hmm. And there is hope. And even reflecting back on like, hey, you've been through hard stuff before. What did that look like? Mm -hmm. And what got you through? And you've done, you haven't done this maybe, but you have done something hard before and you survived. And so there's hope that you can do it again. Mm -hmm. And so reflecting on that, we do that a lot in our groups too. And it really is pretty powerful. I also want to point out, we have to be aware of resources. So you as an adult need to be aware of the resources available to your teenagers, but then also offering them those mm -hmm. resources and making sure they know about it. Not that you're just like holding on to that information and like saying, okay, I think this is best, but maybe invite your teenager into that conversation of like, Hey, here's what's available to you. What do you think would be most helpful? <clears throat> right. Um, it's rarely helpful to tell teenager, teenager, just get over it. Yeah. Um, or, um, we actually talked about this, some um, between Carly and I, where, you know, and faith communities, they say, well, we just need to pray about it a lot. Mm -hmm. And, um, or, um, just ignore it and it will go away. And we just know that's not a complete answer if nothing mm -hmm. else. Uh, I mean, so being aware of what, what does your child have available at school, uh, whether or not it's mental health resources or just something that's going to connect them better to themselves, um, or find an outlet in a place that's kind of, that's kind of stressful. Um, you know, that's why we're such a, a big fan of schools and the, the things that they offer. Um, it's really, uh, a lot of schools have a lot of great programs and, and resources and clubs and things that uh, we can be uh, pointing our teenager to. Um, and another one of those is counseling, obviously. Um, you know, one of, and I actually wrote about this on our blog uh, this month. It's just um, the conversation around this is actually pr pretty robust right now. Mm -hmm. If you, if you talk to teenagers, they're willing to engage on this subject of mental health, but um, and, and also be open to counseling, open to talking to someone, but the access is difficult. Uh, a lot of times for a kid to actually get into a counselor's office or to be able to even pay for it, um, or have that time set aside. But we encourage, um, our listeners and our helpers to uh, see that as a viable option and to ask. And if, you know, you're listening to this, like, I don't know who to reach out to reach out to us, uh, help us, you know, let, let us help you connect, even if we don't live in your town, um, we can help you find resources like that. There are resources available, especially now with telehealth. Um, there are some really great resources that you can find with counseling that um, are really worth the investment for your teenager. Right. There are also lots of hotlines. Um, I'm going to post the link to the um, Suicide and Crisis Lifeline and all of their numbers. This might be a good thing to put in your teenager's phone. Mm-hmm. Um, if they ever need it, most of these you can text or call. So you can call and talk to a person or if they don't feel comfortable doing that and they're having, even in school, they're struggling with something, maybe they can send out a quick text and have someone mm -hmm. respond to them. But um, that could be a good thing that, of like, hey, there are these available for emergencies or just if you need to talk to someone and you don't feel like someone's available, put it in their phone. It could be even helpful for a friend if they have a friend who's going through something. They're like, hey, actually, I have this number on my phone. Let me pull it out. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that could be an option. Churches also often have really good resources. So sometimes they have counseling services or even just if they need someone to talk to who's not you. Um, our youth ministers that we w have worked with in the past are really good resources and um, or can connect you to nonprofits like mm -hmm. us who mm -hmm. they kind of sometimes have an awareness in the community of who can be helpful in that situation. So you could call your local church. And then we have talked about this several, several times, but make sure your teenager has other trusted adults in their life, mm -hmm. whether that is a family member or a friend's parent or a teacher or a coach at school, but be asking them that question of like, Hey, if you didn't come to me, who would you go to and make sure that they have an answer. And they mm -hmm. have that person's phone number and that you've maybe even talked to that person of like, Hey, you're my kid's person. Are you willing to answer the phone if they need something? Mm -hmm. um, and so have that conversation, but make sure that it's, as Chris said, we want our teens to talk to us 
but sometimes they need to talk to someone outside of your home. And so be open to that and letting them know that that's okay. I also think just recognizing mental health and addiction to get them help Mm -hmm. is helpful. So we've done some episodes that I'll try to link on this of recognizing those signs. But um, as I said before, if your teen is sad and hopeless to the point where it's affecting their activities for two weeks or more, those are signs of clinical depression. And so it's not just, oh, they're going through a teenage phase. Oh, they just don't want to be around family anymore. We're going to ignore it. Be looking for those signs to go, oh, this is bigger than I thought and we need to get them help. Mm-hmm. Um, support programs that are working to help teens in school, teens spend all this time at school, um, help support them where they are. And that's what uh, we kind of want to wrap up this episode on, you know, if you were listening to the teen life podcast, um, this isn't just two people talking about teenagers on uh, our, and our off time. This is, uh, this is what we do, um, at, at, at teen life is offer supports like this. And we, we don't often t- use this podcast to, um, to plug our services or, uh, the nonprofit that we, that we work at, but, um, this is a passion of ours. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for 10 years now and Carly is right behind me at eight. Um, um, and Carly, you know, was one of the original support group members and I was one mm-hmm. of the early support group leaders. Um, we found early days of teen life, just the lack of resources for teenagers, uh, yeah. to be able to talk, to be able to share and to be able to access without getting into significant amounts of trouble to get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we believe that teenagers, uh, deserve, deserve, uh, and need quality mental health supports, counseling being one of those. Um, but we offer teen life, uh, support groups on public school camp, pu- public and private school campuses, um, where we, we know that teenagers, if you can meet them where they are and give them a safe space to talk, we'll talk and mm-hmm. we'll grow and we'll, we'll change. We talk about these life skills and in, in our groups, uh, we walk through what it means to deal with stress in a healthy way, to find your resources, to find your people, to create good boundaries, um, to be able to know what you have, um, your strengths. Uh, we connect students to peers and adults because, you know, it's great to talk amongst your peers, but to have a trusted adult to come in and meet you where you are. Um, that's what we, uh, that's what we, our work, that's what we provide. That's how we train. Mm-hmm. Um, we believe that teenagers do deserve, uh, access to quality mental health supports, uh, like what we offer. Right. And just anecdotally, but also we do surveys at the beginning and end of our groups and students say that they find belonging in our groups. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen in my own groups where a student will say, I feel very alone and I'll have eight other people around a table going, we're your people now. Mm -hmm. Sit with us at lunch. Come find us if you're having a rough day. I'm going to ask you how you are. So these students that sometimes feel alone or maybe feel hopeless are finding a place to belong. And then they're also reporting through that survey that they have more hope at the end of the group than they did at the beginning of the group. Mm -hmm. And so, like we said throughout this podcast, hope is powerful. And so the fact that we can offer hope to our teenagers and also that they're just saying like, Hey, after going through through these activities, some of which are just fun and silly talking about stress through Play-Doh. We're coloring gingerbread people to talk about connection. I mean, we're doing simple things, but it's making them realize, like, I have more than I thought I did. I can do this. And we just hear that over and over and over again. And then we also believe if teens go through a support group that they're going to be more likely to seek mental health support later in life because they've done something similar before. And so we hope that our groups are a launching place where they can go later, like, hey, I need help again. I can reach out to teen life or I can call a counselor because I need, I know now what that looks like and I know I need help. And this is the call to action for us is that, uh, what we're doing here, uh, isn't just something we feel good about and, you know, uh, kind of gets us through our day, but we, we know through the data and we know, um, through our experience that, um, teenagers need help and what we do really helps. And so if you are someone who, uh, hears this and feels compelled, um, for as little as $5 a month, you can help us get onto these campuses. You can, 
also get trained uh, to run a group. If you're like, this sounds really cool. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that you can step into. We can train and equip you and place you into these settings to have an immediate impact on the life of a teenager. And so we encourage you, uh, the, the, the donate button will be on this, uh, uh, linked onto this podcast. And we, we don't, we don't, uh, ask for to no donations for no good reason. We really believe this makes a big, uh, a big, big, big difference, especially in light of this, the CDC data. Um, but we also to covet your presence on these campuses mm -hmm. because we can't do it without community volunteers, for, without the investment in our community of their time and their energy. And we believe that our teenagers are, are, are blessed and changed through uh, the support of the people in our communities. Well, I do want to wrap up the podcast, but I want to wrap up with a quote um, that we found. And it's from the book called Girls on the Brink by Donna Jackson Nakazawa. And she, it's specifically about teen girls, but I honestly think it applies to all teenagers, which is the number one most important factor in girls' mental health is having strong, stable, nurturing relationships with caring adults. Mm -hmm. The opposite of trauma is connection. And I so that. I just want to send you with this podcast of we're looking down the barrel of these mental health problems going, what do we do? If mm -hmm. you're an adult who's listening and you care and you're stable and you're prepared to step in and be there for a teen, you are the difference. And you are the one who can turn their trauma into connection and into hope. And so go do that and go just be a force for these teenagers because we care about them. And we know you do too if you're listening to this podcast. So with that, I will wrap up, Chris. Um, uh, we want you to subscribe. We want you to follow us on social media. We will post all the links that we talked about today on our website. This episode in particular covers a lot of mental health stuff and really anyone. If you're a teacher, a coach, a counselor, a parent, a youth minister, anyone needs to hear this stuff if they have a teenager in their life. So text it to a friend. And with that, we'll see you next week.